Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's show, we explore the wellness benefits of labyrinth gardens. Integrative biology professor Kristen Baum gives us an update on the monarch butterflies along the roadside mowing study. Host Casey Hinches has a beautiful landscape tree with a sweet treat. We take a trip to Atlanta, Georgia and run into a familiar face. And Barbara Brown bakes a black and blue berry cobbler. of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We are back out on the side of Highway 51 once again, and joining me today is Dr. Kristen Baum, and she is an Associate Professor for Integrative Biology here at Oklahoma State University. And you're doing some of your research with Dr. Martin in these uh, roadside kind of laboratory areas. Can you kind of tell us what you're doing? Sure. So we're, we're interested in mowing regimes and their effect on resources for monarchs and, and pollinators in general. Mm -hmm. So we've got some different treatment plots where we mow them at different times of the year. So in terms of when they're mowed and how often they're mowed. Yeah. And so the, the idea would be uh, we're working with ODOT to try to identify if there's ways we can shift the mowing regimes that would be beneficial to monarchs so we can uh, serve both the, the needs of ODOT in terms of providing a safe environment for motorists, but then also provide habitat for pollinators at the same time. And we've been talking a little bit about this all season long, and a lot of times there's a lot of emphasis on monarchs in the springtime, but now as we go into fall, you want to make sure that we're still talking about monarchs. Why is it so critical right now? So right now we're really interested in looking at uh, milkweed and milkweed regrowth in particular. So we have a good bit of milkweed at these particular sites in the spring, but then once the milkweed sets seed and the seed pods um, open up, then the plants tend to start to die back. And so they'll be back next year, but they're, they're gone as a resource for this year. But then if you mow, depending on the timing, the milkweed will regrow. Um, and be here for monarchs in the fall. So usually we think about monarchs migrating through Oklahoma in the spring, you know, laying eggs and then moving farther north and then just coming back through Oklahoma uh, during migration in the fall. But we actually have a lot of monarchs that are breeding in Oklahoma uh, starting in, I guess, about mid-August um, is usually when we start, start to see them. So um, they're not just flying through and needing nectar plants, they're actually laying eggs this time again. They're laying eggs and so, uh, and so we, we kind of to that generation as the fifth generation but it's and there's not much known about it uh, there hasn't been much research that's been done on this particular generation of monarchs but but we do have a lot in Oklahoma as well as as Texas and kind of the the southern region at this time of the year and they could contribute um, a lot to the to the population depending on um, you know how many there are and um, and how the population is doing that year. So, so again we don't have quite as much milkweed right now but there is a there's a good taproot on these so some of them push back up um, they regrew and we've got a couple of instars on here can you tell me about these instars and what level they are at and um, yes yeah, so we we still have milkweed usually in the fall um, if there's been um, some type of disturbance, so mowing. Um, and so this particular site was mowed in mid-July, uh, which is, is good timing thinking about other grasslands uh, species, like for example, birds that, that might nest out here as well. Um, and then also for, for the regrowth of the milkweed. So that mm -hmm. way it's got time to, to regrow um, and be here um, at, at this time um, of the year. And so we've got a, a small fourth instar here. So one that's made it through a couple instar stages. Um, and I think I think we've got right there. 
Oh, and then we've got a little little first instar. And so right now we're seeing a lot of, of eggs and, and early instars, uh, but then in a couple of weeks we'll start seeing more more late instars. And so the timing's pretty good for, for most of them to make so it through. So these will still make it. Yep. <laughs> good. So to, to make it through their life cycle and then join the peak migration. So so in the Stillwater, Oklahoma area, uh, peak migration is typically late September, early October. Um, and so this is, this is good timing uh, for them to then be able to, to make it through their life cycle, emerge as an adult butterfly, and then head to Mexico. So they're going to head south instead of going north, like yes. we would typically, typically expect. Okay, and so how do we know what's, uh, or what stage instar these are? So size itself isn't that great of a measure. They can, you know, depending on if they've just molted or which is, is shedding their skin. Uh, so we usually look at the length of the, the front and hind uh, tentacles. So we mm -hmm. can see we've got the projections at both ends. Um, and so that's kind of the best way to, to be able to, to figure out how old they are. So not only do they need food as caterpillars, they're still going to need some nectar plants coming through in the fall. What are some great nectar plants that we have growing in the wild or a homeowner could have for them? So a lot of the, the asters, so in the daisy and the sunflower family, are, are excellent for, for monarchs. So you can think of um, solidago, which is goldenrod, um, liatris, which I think uh, the, the purple, so blazing star, mm -hmm. and, um, and things like that are some of the, the really good ones. Salvia would be another one. And so that's another thing we're interested in for the, for the roadsides. There's not much blooming at the moment, but there are some plants that are in the vegetative stage that, that might be a good resource a little bit later in the year. And then the migration, even though it tends to be late September, early October, um, that can shift a little bit. So last year, our peak migration in, in Stillwater was October 10th and 11th, so mm -hmm. it was a little bit later. Okay. So some of the resources that we always think of as being really, really good were already past their prime. Um, and so then other things were more important. So, you know, so even having some things that, that bloom a little bit, bit later, uh, depending on, on the year, could be very helpful. Very good. Well, thank you for sharing your research with us, Dr. Baum. You're welcome. First United Methodist Church in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and joining me is Sarah Hills, and she is a counseling psychology doctoral student. And today we're here to look at the labyrinth that they have here. Can you kind of tell us a little bit, as gardeners, we often look at uh, garden labyrinths and garden mazes as being the same thing. Mm. Can you differentiate those two for us? Sure, yeah, a labyrinth and a maze do look somewhat similar. However, they're very different in purpose and structure. So um, in a maze, there are dead ends. You can get lost, you can feel trapped or tricked. Um, so they're frustrating. And in a labyrinth, there are no dead ends. Okay. There's no trick to this at all. It's a universal path that just takes you both in and out. As long as you trust that the path will take you where you need to go, you will get there. And this is a little bit of a metaphor for life. Yeah, absolutely, it is. Because we don't actually know where we're headed. Mm -hmm. We have to trust that if we stay on the path, we'll get where we need to go. So as we walk the labyrinth, we know we're headed towards the center. Mm -hmm and then back out again. But you'll notice that even as we approach this turn here, we're actually going to head back to the outside. But we're so close. We're so <laughs> close. I know, we're so close, but we're gonna start heading back to the outside again. Okay. And in most labyrinths, that's how it works. So you feel as though you're losing sight of your goal. But in actuality, there is no goal. Okay, and now you are using this with your studies um, concerning grief counseling. Yes. How does a labyrinth play into grief counseling? Well, I am a grief counselor um, at University Counseling Services, and one of the things we look for are tools that help people to approach their grief rather than try to avoid it. And the labyrinth has been used for grief for centuries. Um, it definitely also mimics the grief journey. It's not linear. Mm -hmm. It's curvilinear. You know? <laughs> we move in and out of it. We have good days. We have days where things are more tough. So as people walk, they find that it helps them to process through some of the things that they've been going through. Um, it fosters creativity okay. and um, allows a person to just be okay. and just to experience what's here. 
um, most of the anecdotal records that had to do with labyrinths um, really suggest that it's very helpful for grief and people notice um, immediate changes in how they feel, what they're experiencing, um, and how they view the process. Now you don't just have to be suffering from grief, I mean this can help a any person, any correct? Person, At any yeah. stage in their life. Any stage, any age, um, it it's here for everyone. That's the beauty of it being available in public spaces as well. It's free, it's simple, it works, um, and it helps people to become more mindful, more in touch with the present moment, uh, and frees them up from the life's worries as they're here. Okay. Um, it's see, available for children. We're now so far away from look the at, center. Look how far we are <laughs> from the center. But we will get back there eventually. Trust that we will. Okay. We will. So Sarah, you know, obviously people aren't typically talking about labyrinths as they're going through a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. What is the process as you go through a labyrinth? What should a person be thinking about? Well, that's another wonderful thing. There just is no expectation. There's no right or wrong way to walk in a labyrinth. Um, the process is simply walking. Okay. And what that does is I think it makes it accessible to everyone, open to everyone. You can't make a mistake here. Um, you can't arrive at the end and think you did it wrong somehow. And I think that's different from other types of exercise that we use. So it also works great for everyone's fitness level. Uh -huh. and their expectations there. You can walk as fast or as slow as you'd like. And many authors believe that just simply stepping into the labyrinth actually begins to foster that mindful, meditative process um, all on its own. You don't have to actually do something. Now, some people can come with an intention. So, walking a labyrinth intentionally means having an idea of something you'd like to focus on mm -hmm. while you're here. And maybe that's a celebration even, like an anniversary or a full moon, <laughs> a solstice or something like that. Um, and so you're walking for an occasion. But maybe it's simply something like as I walk the labyrinth today, I will pay attention to the feel of the ground underneath my feet. And what that does is keep that mindful focus, that focused concentration on the being instead of worrying about the future, thinking about the past, just present and right here. Right. We're pretty far away <laughs> from the <laughs> again, center again. We are, yes. But we will make it eventually. We will. We um, will. I love that it's such a metaphor for life. Now, are all the patterns the same? No, they aren't. Um, most of them are some kind of path encased in a circle. But they come in squares. Um, they are on buildings. They're in pictures. The one that we have um, just recently added to campus is based on a Fibonacci spiral. Mm -hmm. So they're all different. There is a typical type of pattern though and that's some kind of a way weaving path within a circle okay and you've mentioned that some are made even with like light and shadows that it's just a shadow on the ground and stuff yeah they can be made of all different materials they can be mowed in the grass pavers as we see here um, they can be made from light and dark contrasting materials and shadows. Um, in Tulsa, at OSU Tulsa, we have a shadow labyrinth that's on display occasionally. So very portable. They can even be made on canvas, which can be rolled up and taken to different places for display. Excellent. Well, we have made it to the center here. We have. So um, now is a chance to kind of sit and reflect on some of those things? If and... you choose to, yes. Okay. Um, again, no right or wrong thing to do here in the center. Um, it's entirely up to you and what you feel in the moment. You can simply turn around and head back out if that's what you would like to do as well. Okay, well let's take this opportunity. You're also heavily involved in an organization on campus. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I am, sure. Part of my job as, the, as a grief counselor at um, UCS is that I am president of a student organization called AMF, which stands for Actively Moving Forward. And we are a part of a national organization that supports college students who are suffering the loss of a loved one while away from home. We have two components to our group. We have a service group and a support group. Obviously in the support group we're going to be talking about people and sharing our love stories about the people that we've lost. The service group, however, you don't have had to have lost a loved one to be a part of that group. And so people that are in the service group are trying to give back to our campus community. We started kind of our, what we call our labyrinth project as part of a way to give back to the campus. Um, we wanted to have a visual uh, space on campus that was recognizable as something that belonged to our organization so that we could try to support the campus in a, a larger, more constructive way. 
And where could somebody go to find more information about your organization? Well, they can definitely contact me at UCS, um, and you can also check Facebook, AMF at OSU, and we have a Campus Link account as well. Excellent. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Thank you. tell you about a tree that thrives in our hot dry summers. It has no major pest problems. It has edible fruit, beautiful fall foliage, and fragrant flowers. Would you believe me? Well this tree may be the answer to what a lot of you might be looking for and this is the jujube tree or Zizophus jujuba. It's a great tree. It grows well in average soil and actually can handle a little bit higher pH. It's noted for growing in some conditions where other trees would not thrive. This tree gets to be about a moderate height of 15 to 30 feet tall and you can really see the nice form on it. Uh, the fruit right now is weighting down the branches a little bit, but this is a great tree and one of the things that I really love about it is if you look at the foliage on it, a lot of times in late summer, some of our other trees are starting to look a little tattered and worn, but the foliage on this tree just looks fantastic still. It's got a very dark green, glossy leaf to it. Um, you can see it's loaded with small apple-like fruit. Now this fruit, it has kind of a sweet apple taste, but it's a little bit drier. And really the best time to pick it is when it's starting to kind of, starting to turn brown a little bit. Now this fruit is the result of flowers that came on in late spring and the flowers are really insignificant but as you're walking by they're very fragrant and they will definitely grab your attention as well as the pollinators. The nice thing about this jujube tree is a lot of times you might not have a big location to put multiple fruit trees. Jujubes typically don't cross pollinate so you only need to plant one tree unlike apples and some of your other fruit trees. Again, it's a great tree, and right now, jujubes aren't too well known. You definitely won't see these in your supermarkets if you are interested in the fruit, um, but in China, they're well known there. Considering all the great qualities of the jujube tree, it has great foliage, it's a moderate to small tree, and it has hardly any pest problems, plus you get these great edible fruits, I highly recommend that you try this in your garden. It's a taste you'll grow to love. As gardeners, we're always thirsty for knowledge with anything related to plants and gardening. And we are here at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia in Athens, Georgia for the Garden Writers Conference. And this conference is comprised of professionals who are writing those websites, those blogs, and those books that you're reading. And it's nice because we're getting out to see unique gardens, private gardens, botanical gardens, and things like that. And you never know who you're going to run into. Hey Steve, how are you doing hey, today? Hey Casey, good to see you. Good to see you. Now, you're a nurseryman, so what brings you to the Garden Writers Conference? Well, I like to continue to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of us garden educators, garden communicators, and even nurserymen, we, uh, we, we've we gone to school, we've learned all of the, the information, the books and everything can uh, can teach us there. Right. But to uh, continue to learn things, we, we go to these conferences and symposiums and just other gardens to uh, see new plants, see new ideas, and, uh, and that kind of thing. So when I'm at a botanical garden or a private garden, I always enjoy kind of getting a sense of the region and what plants grow there and also looking at different color combinations and how those plants are used. What is it from your perspective that you're looking for? Well, uh, as a nurseryman, I'm looking for new varieties, uh, maybe new species and, and uh, things like that. And it's kind of cool when you come to a place that's uh, further south than Oklahoma. It's, uh, it can get even hotter here at times, uh, maybe a little more humid at times yes. here in, in uh, Georgia than back home. So if I see a plant performing well here in the heat, uh, I know it's, there's a good chance it's going to do well back in Oklahoma as well. Excellent. Well, this is this is such a great thing, and I would encourage our visitors anytime they're on vacation or in a professional symposium somewhere, whether it's a garden-related one or not, take advantage of those local botanical gardens because you never know what ideas you can take home from it. And here's a little flavor of the gardens that we've seen this week at the GWA conference in Atlanta, Georgia.
doing black and blueberry cobbler. Now you could do straight blueberry, you could do straight blackberry, or you could throw in different uh, fruits if you chose. I'm doing the blackberries and the blueberries because there are qu quite a lot of them around this year. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is I need a, a quart of fruit. So I've got two cups of blackberries and two cups of blueberries. Now one of the things you may have noticed if you're buying blueberries on the market this year is that there are a lot of them that are really, really huge have a great flavor, uh, but if you're trying to make something like blueberry muffins, the size of the blueberry can actually get in and interfere uh, and, and cause you some problems when you're making the muffins. So uh, two cups of, uh, of those, total of, of one quart of fruit altogether. And on top of that, I'm gonna sprinkle in a third of a cup of sugar and a tablespoon of flour. Now, if you are clever and talented, you can actually do this in the pan that you're going to use. I tend to make a mess that way, so I'm going to do it in, a, in the bowl, but then I'm going to use the same bowl to mix up the toppings, so I'm not getting an extra bowl dirty. I'm just saving a little bit later on. Now this I have sprayed with a nonstick spray. If you don't like those, you could coat it with butter, just a little bit, and then you'll notice that the sugar shakes to the bottom, so kind of spread that around as well, or you'll end up with it all in one place and it may crystallize on you later. If you wanted to, you could stir that around a little bit too. Now for the topping, because this is a cobbler, so it doesn't have the bottom crust, it just has the top uh, and it's going to be more biscuit-like. Uh, so I'm going to use um, one and a half cups of flour, it's just all-purpose flour, another fourth of a cup of sugar, two teaspoons of baking powder, and a fourth of a teaspoon of kosher salt. Now we don't want this mixed together a lot. Actually, I'm going to use a whisk. At this point, we want it, everything blended well together, but when we blend in or pour in the milk, uh, then just like with all biscuits, we want to limit the amount of gluten that gets formed. We want these to be really tender, and so we're going to limit the amount of stirring that we do. Just basically going to stir it until it gets a nice, a nice dough form, but it, we're not going to knead it. This is more like a drop biscuit. Some of the ingredients in here are also going to help protect it. The amount of sugar that we have will help protect uh, you from getting too much gluten formed. So you've got a couple of things that are going your way. So if you would over stir it just a little bit, you're still probably going to be all right. This is just going to go on in big dollops around and across. And there's no real technique to it. If you want them to look separate, then you might want to make larger ones farther apart. If you want them to look like it's gone clear across and become one uh, giant mass of, of topping, then you might put them on a little bit differently. It's going to go in a 350 degree oven, which you've preheated, and you're going to bake it somewhere between 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how hot your oven is. But you want the top to be nice and golden, so that it somewhat resembles this one. And this is what you're going to get. It's black and blueberry cobbler. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we visit a labyrinth garden with a twist on the OSU Stillwater campus. We tag and release monarch butterflies, and we install decomposed granite around the beds in our concepts garden. So join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service 
as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.